Well, hello. Welcome back to the Small Town Pastors Vlog. Uh, my name is Nate Babcock. I'm the preacher of Buchanan Christian Church in Buchanan, Michigan. Uh, my partner in crime is Keith Robinson, a pastor at Cave City Christian Church in Cave City, Kentucky. Uh, Keith and I enjoy having these conversations about church leadership and biblical studies and other uh, related topics. Uh, first of all, because we just enjoy talking about these, these subjects with each other and uh, sharing life together in ministry, but also because uh, we hope to we hope to have conversations that benefit those who listen. And um, we spent most of this year, 2021, in the Small Town Pastors vlog talking about uh, issues related to church leadership. Last episode, we made a transition uh, to the story of how we got the Bible uh, and looking at and understanding the various English translations of the Bible, and in our last ep last episode, we kind of covered the story from Old Testament to Reformation, a whole bunch of history there in one fail swoop, <laughs> and I guess a little bit post Reformation. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're we're gonna come back to that story, so to speak, in our next episode when we talk about the uh, various uh, English translations and a little bit of their history. Um, as well as as well as other aspects of the, those English translations, but today uh, we want to focus on the philosophy and methodology of Bible translation, as well as the textual basis of our uh, modern versions of the Bible. So, Keith, uh, take it away with philosophy and methodology of Bible translation. All right. So, there's going to be a lot of caveats as we have this conversation. And the first really sort of big one is that realistically, all acts of translation require some sort of interpretation. Um, just the simple fact that there are no two languages that are an exact one-to-one -one when it comes to, you know, this word exactly means this word, you know, this sentence structure exactly matches this sentence structure. All languages are structured differently. And therefore, when you translate from one language to another, you have to interpret a little bit to make what was said over here make sense over here. Uh, so the question then becomes, how much interpretation do we do uh, in translation as we are trying to take this message that was written 2,000, 3,000 years ago in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek and put it into a language that we can understand today in English, in our culture, in our setting. And that's an ongoing debate that has been happening for, I don't know, a couple centuries now. Um, the, there are sort of three major schools of thought uh, on philosophy to use when it comes to translating scripture into English or into other languages for that matter too. Uh, and that would be the formal equivalence, the dynamic equivalence, and the paraphrase. So the first of these, the formal equivalence, is seeking to remain as close to the original as possible. So uh, we understand there isn't an exact word for word match, but uh, if we're doing a formal equivalence, we're trying to be as word for word as possible. Uh, retaining that flow, that flavor from the original authors. Um, so this usually requires more technical language, more theological language. Um, we talked about William Tyndale last time, um, and he took this approach and had to invent a whole bunch of words in, in order to make what was being said make sense. Uh, and we still use a lot of those words today. Um, so this because of all of that, uh, these often are a little more difficult to understand um, because it's not going to flow as well as it might uh, otherwise if we're using one of the other approaches or again, we're using more difficult words as a way to bring those across. Um, and so some examples of this would be like the King James Version, uh, the New American Standard Bible, the English Standard Version, um, all of these are attempting to be formal equivalents. They're, they're trying to be as close to the original as possible. Very often that means 
not only an attempt to as much as possible find the word for word correspondence, but often um, duplicating syntax and sentence structure even. Right. Uh, often syntax and sentence structure in Hebrew and Greek are different. Mm -hmm. The way we arrange our sentences and relate our words to one another in English. Right. Uh, these, these formal equivalence translations often, I mean, sometimes it's just flat out impossible in English to do that and then have it make any sense whatsoever. But as much as possible, they try to stick to word order and sentence structure from, from original language to receptor language. Mm -hmm. uh, in it, yeah, in English. Yeah. yeah, so um, one of the ones that I find somewhat amusing for this is there's a, it's from the 1800s called Young's Literal Translation, where, I mean, that's exactly what he did. He just said, all right, we're going to keep this in the exact order that it is and Ooh. just make it. Uh, and I mean, it works. You have no idea what it's saying most of the <laughs> time, but it works. It's a little bit like, um, to end up a little bit like Yoda from Star yes. Wars, right? Get your verbs and your uh, nouns and your subjects all backwards and mixed up, and, <laughs> right? right. Yeah. And I mean, there, there are times where you also have to take into account, and we'll, we'll talk about this more later, I guess, or we just do it now either way, um, what you do with figurative language. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's easy enough if you're just like going through a historical account and say, all right, this means this, this means this, this means this. But when you start doing things that are poetic or where you know somebody is using similes, metaphors, hyperbole, uh, when somebody's using figures of speech, idioms, all that kind of stuff, well, what do you do with that? Do you keep it in the language as it was, use the figure of speech the way they would have used it? Do you replace it with a figure of speech in English that would make sense for us? Do you, you know, do away with the figurativeness altogether? And those figures of speech are all over the place in the Bible. Right. I have a great example here. It, it, it's great. It's also uh, a little crude. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if I can find this. While you're looking for yours, Go ahead. One, that, one that I've always found humorous that we talked about when I was in Hebrew class is uh, there's a Hebrew idiom that gets attributed to God quite often that the if you were to translate it literally, it means that whoever you're talking about has a long nose. Yeah, a long nose, yeah. And it's in, in their way of thinking, you know, if you get angry, your nostrils flare, and so the longer it takes for that to happen, the longer it takes for you to get angry. Therefore, if you have a long nose, it means you are patient. Yes. Uh, and so uh, Tyndale, when he came across this, he translated the phrase of having a long nose as being long suffering, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, when we read, especially some of the older translations, that word appears all the time of God being long suffering. Um, it's his attempt to take that idiom and make it make sense in English in still somewhat of a poetic way instead of just saying, oh, God is patient. Because mm -hmm. there's a little more to it than that, the way the, the Hebrew mind works. Yeah, long suffering. Yeah, it does. It definitely has a poetic quality to it. And yeah, therefore connotate something more than just the more bare word patient, you know. Right. So, okay, First Samuel 25. Okay. Um, and this is where uh, David sends some of his men to Nabal uh, and asks for provisions for his men, like food and water, you know, because David's men have been guarding Nabal's shepherds. And Nabal is a rough fellow, and he rejects David's request and insults David. And this makes David very angry. And he gets together 400 of his 600 men, and they're going to go to, to Nabal's camp and or his household and kill every every male and david his anger comes through here because the hebrew the hebrew idiom that he uses is i mean we would call it vulgar right um and and the king james version translates it i guess what you would what you would call literally right mm -hmm. there's this is formal equivalence in action here 
Now, this is David's speech to Abigail, Nabal's wife, part of it, verse 22. So, for again, King James Version, so and more also, do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, most, most, most more modern English translations will render that males or men. Right. Because that's what the, the, the Hebrew figure of speech, those that pisseth against the wall, is talking about men, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but the King James Version, and maybe that wasn't as offensive to sensibilities in 1611 or, you know, 1700s, whenever that was revised, right. as, it, as it might be today, you know. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the Bible is full of those kinds of figures of speech. And what do you do with them, right? right. Yeah. And that's, you know, so this is a, when we talk about the formal equivalents, you know, they're, they're, the goal is to stay as close to the original as possible. Uh, but even in those moments, you know, mm -hmm. just with these couple of examples, you know, there, there's no way to exactly stay uh, with what the original says and still have it make any sort of degree of sense. Yeah, you're going to sacrifice something. If you say God is long of nose, right? Mm -hmm. and that's, meant to, that's meant to communicate that he doesn't get angry quickly or easily, right? Right. Um, that, that, you know, that to the English reader, that's not going to make any sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas pisseth against the wall makes sense, but it's vulgar. Right. right? And, and many would prefer to smooth that out, you know, and just say what the euphemism means rather than what the euphemism says. Right. Right. And... You know, in case, you know, somebody out there is saying, well, this, you know, why would they, they talk like this anyway? Well, I mean, to be fair, we have all sorts of idioms and figures of speech. Oh, yeah, all over the place. Today. Uh, and we just, because we're so used to them, we don't even realize that's what they are. Right. Uh, so like with the one with patience, whereas the Hebrew people would say, you know, you have a long nose or you have a short nose. We might say you have a long fuse or a short fuse, yeah. referring to like, you know, being an explosion of dynamite and stuff. Yes. But, um, but we understand that when we say that, you know, I don't have an actual fuse hanging off my body somewhere that you know, I'm going to light up. And once it reaches its max, it's going to explode. It's just a figure of speech. So Keith, let's talk about, and I think we've already been kind of hinting in this, mm -hmm. in this discussion the last couple of minutes, but what would you say are some of the strengths and maybe some of the weaknesses or problems of the formal equivalence approach? Well, I think one of the biggest strengths of it is that due to the nature of what formal equivalence translators are trying to do, there is a little bit less interpretation involved. Uh, now that means you know, that what we are given when the translation happens may not make as much sense, but it leaves it up to us, the reader, to be the one doing the interpretation rather than having the interpretation done for us and then assuming that all of that interpretive work is what was originally meant. Yeah, um, that's a good, that, that's a very positive thing in many ways about the formal equivalence approach. Um, something else that I like as, you know, someone, you know, as, for doing what we do, Keith, in Bible study, for teaching, mm -hmm. preaching, and so on and so forth, um, is that formal equivalence translations tend to translate the same Greek or Hebrew word with the same English word when that is warranted, right? right. They, they, they will translate the word differently with a different English word when it's clear that the context requires that, right? But um, I can look at the English Standard Version or the New the New American Standard Version, uh, and because they translate words consistently for the most part, um, I can look at those and and just immediately know which Greek or Hebrew word is behind uh, the English word, uh, and it it makes uh, word studies and other kinds of uh, work in the biblical text a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I suppose. Now, I should throw out this caveat here just in the, the spirit of honesty, uh, that if you are somebody that listens to me preach or teach, overwhelmingly formal equivalence translations are what I use. Uh, 
Um, every Sunday morning, I preach out of the New American Standard. Yeah, Nate's the same way. I use the English Standard. Yeah. Uh, I, on Wednesday nights, I use the English Standard version when I'm I'm teaching. Um, so this is, you know, the overwhelming majority of the time. These are the translations that I use, uh, and so they're the ones I'm most familiar with, most comfortable with uh, when it comes to uh, doing, especially any sort of serious uh, Bible study, Bible teaching. Uh, kind of thing. So I, I do have that that bias or that preference in the background while having this conversation. I do as well. You know, and I don't know, I don't know what I'm about to say, Keith, if it's a strength or a weakness. I think it probably could be one or the, it could be either depending on who you are and what your needs are, right? Earlier, you said that the formal equivalence translations require a more technical and often a little bit more theological vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see definitely how that's a weakness because if it's if if that's not your reading level or if you're not familiar with those words or you're not initiated into that lingo, so to speak, it can right. be kind of it could be dense and difficult to understand. Um, and and so it can be a downfall. It can be a problem. Um, there are there maybe this has to do with my personality and my preferences. I do think that there are some positives about that, right? I, I do think that uh, Christianity having its own somewhat distinctive vocabulary way of speaking about God and God's world is actually a good thing. Uh, and, that, and that those words, whether in English or in um, Hebrew and Greek, having to make the effort to learn what they mean there's something positive about that because the the um, the words that are being translated, the Hebrew and Greek words that are being translated, often acquired a technical theological status within their own context and milieu. Right? Mm -hmm. they, they often had that status in their own, you know, in their own setting before they, you know, and so um, and I'm probably not explaining myself very well here, but. Um, I just, I just think that there is something positive and good about that, that um, Christianity loses something if, if, if its language becomes so bland that um, it has nothing distinctive to say. Am I making any sense? Yeah. Let me explain this, Keith. Yeah. But, so I think, you know, an example that comes to mind, just because uh, we were talking about this on Wednesday, um, the Greek language has four different words that can all be translated as love mm -hmm. in English. I think most people are somewhat familiar with this concept. Sure. It's, it's a common like, sermon illustration, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the word that gets translated for love that almost always is used in reference to God's love is agape or agapao. Um, this idea of a love that is unconditional, that does what is spiritually best for other people. Uh, and we often will talk about that, you know, when we talk about, you know, we need to love the way God loves, or we need to experience God's love, or we need to, you know, have love for God, love for one another. You know, those passages in the New Testament all use agape. Um, but what we don't often take into account is that the word agape existed well before the New Testament, mm -hmm. and it was used differently mm -hmm. by non-biblical writers. Mm -hmm. um, it's and it seems that when it came time to write the New Testament, when Paul, when Luke, when others were were oh. sitting down to to yeah. think about how do we convey this message, uh, they took this word that wasn't used all that much and had a different meaning and said, "We're going to make it mean this," mm -hmm. uh, and so they they repurposed it. Uh, and ever since then, that word has had the implication that we would associate with it uh, of loving the way that God loves us. But that's not what the word originally meant. Right. Yeah, that's a good example, a real good example. So, you know, we've, we're naming some of what we consider to be some of the strengths or positives of the formal equivalence mm -hmm. um, methodology and approach. You know, we've also listed what are some of the weaknesses a, a, a little bit more technical and difficult vocabulary, sometimes a wooden uh, or just not natural to English sentence structure and sentence flow. Um, 
Yeah, what are some of the other maybe weaknesses or problems with this approach? There is no perfect approach to Bible training. Right. Um, so yeah, and I think you know one of the things we'll talk about more as we go through the others is that each methodology, it's not necessarily that one is inherently greater than the other, it's that one is inherently more beneficial for a specific purpose yeah. uh, than another. And, and so formal equivalence translations, they're real strength is in you know serious study you know if you want to do study yeah if you want to do really deep hard work in english language in, in a way that's going to lend itself well for that these are the kinds of translations that are good for that uh, versus you know if you're just looking for something to maybe use as your daily devotional or you know something that's light and easy to read for for children or for people that are learning english as a second language right. and a different version or a different method uh, would be better suited for that yeah for sure so let's talk about the second one then um, dynamic equivalence yeah so a dynamic equivalence is instead of being word for word the goal is to be thought for thought so it's, you know, let's take this phrase, let's take this sentence, let's take this passage, and we're going to not necessarily take, all right, this word means this, this word means this, but we're going to say, all right, how do we take this whole chunk and make it make sense in English? Uh, and for the most part, the goal here is to do what we were just talking about, to make it easier to understand, easier to read, you know, to... Uh, simplify things or to smooth things out uh, when possible to make it clear. Do you think that, do you think it's fair to characterize it in this way, Keith, that in the in formal equivalence, the goal is accuracy of meaning, mm -hmm. whereas in the, where is it, wait, did I say that right? I'm sorry, dynamic equivalence, the goal is accuracy of meaning, whereas in formal equivalence, the goal is accuracy of wording? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is yeah, that I think. A fair way to say it? Yeah, the people that um, really advocate dynamic equivalences, they will usually say that formal equivalence um, is either impractical or it's not actually doing what it's, it says it's trying to do because it doesn't make it make sense for the English reader. Uh, and so you still have to do a whole bunch of stuff. You still get things lost in translation because you don't understand or are not able to figure out well, what those translators are trying to do. Uh, so yeah, the, the people that would advocate for this are saying, you know, we are trying to give the meaning of the text in a way that English readers can understand it rather than being worried about individual words. So here we have, and I think that NIV, the New International Version, falls somewhere on the spectrum between yeah. formal equivalence and yeah, dynamic. It's like a half and half. It's like a half and half. Yeah. Um, so, but so, but the so yes. Sometimes when you're reading the NIV, it's it, it leans more one way or the other. Okay. But then you would also in this uh, sphere, you would probably have the Living Bible, the New Living Translation. Uh, HCSB, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Christian Standard Bible. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, those are the main ones here, the NIV, the NLT, the HCSB, um, yeah. and others that are like them. I suppose maybe something uh, something that's, okay, uh, I think increasingly common in usage among like some Nazarenes and others is the CEB, the Contemporary English, English Bible. Yeah. That is very much a formal equivalence yeah. Uh, dynamic equivalence uh, translation for the most part. Yeah, uh, it's dynamic NC almost bordering on paraphrase. Yeah, the NCV, the New Century Version, very similar, dynamic almost bordering on paraphrase. I have, where did I put that? I have a little chart that probably won't be readable on the screen, but that does a good illustration of this. I don't know where it went. It's in this folder somewhere. Not that one. Not that one. Or that one. I literally just saw this like 10 minutes ago. There it is. Yeah. Like well, I said, this is not at all going to be readable on the screen. Yeah. 
But um, good chart though. Yeah. So the on the word for word, the the formal equivalent side, it lists the New American Standard, the Amplified Bible, which is a, a really weird one. Uh, we'll talk about that when we go through the actual translations themselves. Um, but the English Standard, the Revised Standard, the King James, the New King James, um, in that sort of middle gray area is the Holman Christian Standard, the New Revised Standard, the NIV, uh, the two Catholic ones, the New American and the New Jerusalem. Uh, and then in the central and the thought for thought, the dynamic equivalents, you get the TNIV, the updated NIV version, the NCV, the New Century version, the NLT, the NIRV, the children's version of the NIV, uh, and then the GNT, uh, the Good News Translation. And then when you get sort of in that gray area between uh, thought for thought and paraphrase, uh, the CEV and uh, the contemporary English version, the living Bible, and then formally in paraphrase, you have the message. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are some like, and there are some strengths with the dynamic equivalents. It is often more readable, uh, more more natural sounding and flowing in English. Mm -hmm. Uh, much of the, not all of it, but much of the more technical and theological vocabulary is, it's not eliminated, it's just maybe downgraded a little bit. I don't know what the right way is to say it. They, 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 um, yeah, it, it's, it's often like a word like propitiation, right? right? Like the, the formal equivalence translations would use the English, the, the, the dynamic equivalence translations might give the three or four word meaning of propitiation as the translation, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. 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 Um, sacrifice that turns away wrath, you know? Yes. Something like that. Yeah. So the, the strength here is definitely readability. Mm -hmm. uh, Understandability. It, it flows easier. You don't have to be as good with all of the big, huge, you know, theological terms. Uh, you don't need a, a dictionary and a thesaurus right next to you to be able to read it and understand what it's saying. Um, so this is definitely a much better option for somebody that has a, a lower reading level, uh, either, you know, somebody who's young, somebody who's learning English as a second language, somebody who struggles with reading comprehension uh, for one reason or another. You know, these are going to be much more practical and beneficial for those individuals. Um, and then also, yeah, if you are um, just looking for like light Bible reading, you know, your, your time spent in daily devotions or, you know, other aspects where you're, you're not trying to do formal serious study, uh, you're just trying to read and retain uh, or, or get something inspirational out of it. Uh, these are a good option for that. You know, um... Like Keith, I spend most of my time in the formal equivalence translations. Every once in a while, though, I just want something different, right? Mm -hmm. I want, I kind of get tired of the same old, same old, right? And I want something that says, says it in a different way, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'll pick up the New Living Translation or uh, the, you know, the Contemporary English Bible or something just to read it said differently. Right. Um, but I do think I do think we need to talk about here, Keith, what you've already mentioned, that the further you go on this spectrum into, you know, toward the dynamic equivalence and, and then beyond, the more interpret interpretive work is being done for you by the translation itself. Right. And and why that why that can be problematic. Well, and I think so this is going to be true of any translation. If we only ever read the one, mm -hmm. you know, whichever one that is, I don't care if it's King James, if it's the message, you know, what have you, if you only ever read the one, mm -hmm. it's very easy to assume that automatically that translation is the way that whatever was said in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic uh, should be read and interpreted. And English. I mean, the, the extreme example of this is the people that say the King James Version is the only 
version that should be authorized to be used in English. It's the the only one that's inspired. It's the only one that we should ever do anything with. And um, when you take that approach, you know, one, you sound kind of, I don't even know what word I want to use here. Like okay. <laughs> but um, but yeah, you're, you're, you're digging yourself into this niche that, um, again, all translation has an interpretation aspect of it. And so if you only focus on one, you are only getting one interpretation. Um, but yeah, when we get into dynamic, and especially when we get into paraphrase, because so much interpretation or so much more interpretation is being done, it's easier to accidentally lose the, the meaning of the original, purely because the people who are putting these translations together are not themselves inspired the way that Paul or Moses or one of the biblical authors was inspired. Right. So the, the more people you put into the mix working and interpreting, the easier it is to get away from what the author's original intended meaning might have been. Yeah. You know, the people that do the work of Bible translation, man, these people work hard. Yes. And do great work. Yes. Um, they're all humans. And like each of us, they come from their own background and perspective, right? And so they, when you're, and this is true, don't misunderstand, this is true with formal equivalent, formal mm -hmm. equivalence as well. But when you're doing the work of Bible translation, you're necessarily going to interpret, you're going to translate and interpret in line with your own theological convictions, right? right. And so uh, the, you know, we'll talk about this when we talk about, in more detail, we'll talk about it when we go through the English translations. But the English translations, to one degree or another, reflect the theological interests or right. preferences or convictions of the translators, right? right? And 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 that can only be more pronounced when uh, you're working in the dynamic equivalence field, right. because more of that work is being done. Uh, it, it you know more. You know, instead of just representing one Hebrew or Greek word with one English word, um, you might have that ink, that Hebrew or Greek word represented with, and it's not always possible to do a one-to-one, -one, but you know what, I, what I'm trying to say is they might use a whole sentence or phrase uh, to really try to give the accurate meaning of uh, that word in Hebrew or Greek. There's just so much interpretive decision making that's going on there. Right. Um, that again, as Keith said, it's being done for us rather than requiring us as the reader to do it ourselves. Right. So an example of this that Good. I'm glad you have one. <laughs> <laughs> an example that probably hits close to home for us that are in the Christian Church and Church of Christ, because this is one of the things that really gets, I guess, harped on in our movement is the concept of baptism. Now, the, the, there is the original Greek word baptizo, which means to immerse. It's actually originally a cooking term. It's, you know, if you're gonna boil your vegetables or whatnot, you have to dunk it in the water uh, so that it's completely submerged and can be boiled versus roundizo, which means to pour water or something over it. Well, over time, you know, the idea of baptism happening by sprinkling or by pouring or you know just purely through a spiritual means no physical means at all uh, became an increasingly popular doctrine uh, i think you can correct me if i'm wrong on this i think part of that had to do with a couple of interrelated issues one was the sort of parallel doctrine that um, the Catholic Church believes or believed um, of original sin, that you are automatically sinful the moment you are born and are destined for hell from that moment unless you are saved, coupled with things like the plagues, 
where you know a third of the population of Europe all died of this terrible, terrible disease. Uh, and so you had people saying, you know, my infant child, you know, just died of the plague. Does that mean they're going to hell because they never reached the age where they could be baptized by immersion? But that's not their fault. You know, they, they had no control over this. Uh, and so, you know, individual priests and eventually the, the church as a whole said, well, we will perform baptism by sprinkling or by pouring over infants because we want to make sure they're covered uh, in case. Yeah. They... Baptism removes the stain of original sin. Yeah. Uh, and so when it came time to translating the word baptizo into English, uh, we have King James to thank for this largely um, because he was somebody who was baptized by sprinkling as an infant. And so one of his requirements when his translation was being made was that the translators could not take the word baptizo and write it as immerse. They had to just transliterate it, which means you take the word in its original language and just copy and paste. Uh, you don't have to the sound. Uh, yeah. Basically of the word, right? Yeah. With, with English letters. Yeah. And so that is where the word baptize in English comes from. It's just taking the Greek letters that make up the word baptizo, turning them into English letters and calling it baptize. Um, and all of that, and still today, you know, it leads itself to, all right, since we haven't translated the word, we've just copied and pasted it over, we can interpret what that word means. Uh, and so various groups will say, well, it means immersion. Well, it means sprinkling. Well, it means pouring. Well, it doesn't mean any physical action. It's just a, a spiritual act. Um, yeah, that's a good example. And the, but the, even, the, even the most uh, strict formal equivalence translations you expect. That's true. Right? <laughs> so tradition plays a role in this, right? I mean, tradition tradition absolutely plays a role in mm -hmm. how our, our Bible translations end up being rendered, right? Right. Because it's been that way for so long, that's what we've always done, and now that's the word in English that we're used to. Right. Yeah. I think another example conceptually would be, um, historically, a lot of translators have come from backgrounds that are relatively Calvinistic in nature. Uh, which and you don't have to know all of the ins and outs of this, but one of the doctrines of Calvinism is the idea of once saved, always saved. Um, it's not possible to lose your salvation. Um, and so when you come, there, there are passages in scripture where it, it does lend itself to this idea. And sure. there are passages that would seem to go against this idea. Um, and so when the translators come across those passages, you know, they already have their, I don't want to miss, I mean, they are biases. I don't want to use that word, but they have their, their preferences, their, their ways of thinking, you know, from the way they've grown up, the you know, background that they have, and all of that plays a factor in this. And so somebody who comes from uh, a Calvinistic background and believes in once saved, always saved, is probably more likely to take the passages that would disagree with that and maybe word it in such a way to soften it or to you know, make it make sense from their perspective. And again, if we are using a dynamic equivalence, it opens the possibility to do that more frequently uh, and to a larger degree uh, because we're saying, well, we're trying to take what this passage says and make it make sense in English. And I think it should mean this so that's the way I'm going to put it. I'm going to render it, yeah. And to be fair, the same thing could be true with people on the other side of the oh, fence. Of course, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah people who you know, of, any particular, of any particular doctor, yeah. Right. I, I bring that one up because, uh, like I said, a lot of the, the English translations that are popular today, um, mm -hmm. a good chunk of their translators uh, are Calvinistic. Uh, yeah, come from reform, reform backgrounds. Right. Which, I mean, it, it just makes sense. Those are very large denominations. There's a lot of money in those denominations. 
Uh, and so they have a, a very vested interest in putting together translations and they have the resources to do it. The resources so, to do it. So. Um, let's, well, I don't think we need to spend as much time on paraphrase, but let's, let's at least touch on it. Then maybe we could put a bow on this part of it with philosophy and methodology mm -hmm. and move forward to the textual basis. Okay. So a paraphrase is, I mean, as the name implies, I'm not trying to word for word or thought for thought convey the message. I'm taking the message and putting it in my own words. Um, usually the um, like the, the background for this or the reasoning for this is to make it seem fresh or because you have a particular purpose in mind. Uh, so the message Bible is the most famous of these paraphrases and uh, Eugene Peterson, the guy who put it together, you know, he was very bluntly, you know, I'm teaching a group of people who have never encountered the Bible before or who have encountered the Bible for so long that it's just become monotonous to them. So he created his own translation, his the message paraphrase as a way to sort of make it come alive in a, a new and unique way for his audience and then published it. Uh, but yeah, his, his, he was never saying that, you know, I want to use this for serious academic study or even that I want to, you know, try to use this for you know, theological study the way we might with NIV or anything of like that. It's, you know, I have a specific purpose in mind uh, and I'm just making it available to everybody else. Right. And Eugene Peterson was a Bible scholar. And, uh, yes. And he was very adept theologically and he was a wordsmith, right? He was a yes. master wordsmith. Yeah, um, I think he takes a lot of flack for oh, he, message he unnecessarily. Flack. Yeah, you just got to understand, like you were saying, what his purpose was and the right way to use something like that, right? Mm -hmm. You do not use that as your sole or even primary translation for Bible reading or study. Right. You use that as an accompaniment, right? As uh, something that, uh, uh, you know, can provide some inspiration, a very fresh or different way to think about the text, um, can be good, maybe a good tool. And again, even, even if I were using it for the purpose that Eugene was using it for, introducing people with no familiarity to the Bible for the first time, I would, I would, I would still use something else besides just his translation. And maybe he did as well, right? I mean, his own, his own background was Presbyterian. He probably largely used the revised and new revised standard versions in his own primary work. Right. I would guess that that was part of his repertoire in teaching those people the Bible as well. But he might have used his message translation as a starting point or an entry point, you know. Um, and so it can be valuable for some of those kinds of things. You just have to understand its limitations. Right. That it is um, very, very free. Huh. Yes. Very, very free with the text. So um, one thing, and I think we've more or less already said this, but I want to confirm it, if nothing else. Um, we are not necessarily advocating that one method is better than another, or even that one translation is better than another. Uh, if anything, uh, my recommendation would be to say, look at multiples. Yeah. Um, because when you look at the same passage in multiple translations, you can start seeing where some of these underlying things are at. Uh, and it can make you question, all right, why did the New American Standard do it this way, but the NIV did it this way? And yeah. what would be going on underneath that would cause that disparity? Yes, for sure. That's one of the best ways to get, to become familiar with the question marks mm -hmm. in Bible translation is to see the differences between the translations. I'm thinking of, a pretty simple example here, mm -hmm. find it. Um, so I'm gonna pull this up in uh, Genesis chapter 12. Um, so I'm gonna use the example here is Genesis chapter 12, verse one. Uh, I'm gonna, and the translations we're gonna compare are the English Standard Version and the NIV. So the English, so the NIV, this is just the first line of Genesis 12, 1. The NIV, the Lord had said to Abram. The ESV, now the Lord said to Abram. 
right? Really, the only difference there is the the little word had, mm -hmm. right? The Lord had said to Abram, NIV, the ESV, now the Lord said to Abram. So the NIV makes it past tense, had said, whereas the ESV is present tense, now the Lord said. Mm -hmm. Why the difference in tense, right? right? Between, between the NIV and the ESV? Well, that's because the NIV is attempting to do a little harmonizing, right? Mm -hmm. With what takes place later in Genesis, where apparently here in Genesis 12, Abram is in uh, Haran, right? And uh, God is speaking to him in Haran and calling him to, to leave his country and his people and his you know, father's family and all that. But later on in the Genesis narrative, God says that he had spoken to Abram while he was yet in Ur of the Chaldees, right? And um, so the NIV is trying to harmonize uh, what happens in Genesis 12 with what Genesis later says mm -hmm. and, and make this uh, a present, a, a, a past tense uh, statement from God to Abram rather than a present tense one in, in the interest of preserving um, uh, chronological continuity. Right. It's trying to smooth out a little bit of a difficulty, right, in the text. Uh, so if, you, if, you're, if you're paying attention to the English translations and you're comparing them and you pick up on just that slight difference, the presence or absence of that one word had and the tense past or present, that can give you a clue like, okay, Something's going on here. There's a reason for this, right? And it's not just stylistic or superficial. Right. And the the so the, the the bigger background there is that unlike English, where you know we cannot in our language we cannot reference a verb without a time, without a tense. Yes. Yeah. We're we're in present tense. We're in past tense. We're in future tense. Um, but there, there, there's no way to say a verb without also saying, you know, is it past, is it present, is it future? Mm -hmm. um, the Hebrew language is not like that. The Hebrew language doesn't have past, present, or future. Uh, they have it's interpretation. You have to interpret based <laughs> on the context. Yes. What is the time reference of the verb? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's one of those. Um, and so the entire Old Testament, you're, you're doing this, you know, yeah. how do we take this and make it make sense in English when one language has to have a time for reference and the other language doesn't have any time references. Um, so it's at least not that are built into the word itself. Right. Yeah. Context, it will make it pretty clear the vast yeah. majority of the time. Right. Um, but Hebrew focuses on completion. Is yeah. this action done or is it not done? Uh, but that can be complete or incomplete action in the past, present, or future. Uh, and so it's not that the, it's not that the NIV is necessarily wrong, right? And to it, and both the NIV and the ESV are 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 making an interpretive decision there, which they have to do. They have no choice, right? To make an interpretive decision. It's just it's clear, at least to me, that the NIV is attempting a little harmonization mm -hmm. there, where the ESV is not, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they, the NIV has done the interpretation for us. The ESV is leaving it up to us to interpret, all right, how do we make this make sense with what comes later? With what comes later, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So um, there's so many more interesting things we could talk about, but to summarize, the three primary schools of thought when it comes to Bible translation are formal equivalence, a word for word, and often, um, a word for word approach that often also applies to sentence structure uh, and uh, that is represented by the King James Version, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, formal equivalence. Secondly, the dynamic equivalence, thought for thought, attempting to, to convey meaning more than wording, uh, represented by at least some parts of the NIV, but, uh, but, but more by like the New Living Translation. And then the paraphrase, which um, is all about making things contemporary and fresh in the receptor language in English, um, represented by the message most well known. So uh, now let's talk about the textual basis that underlies all of our translations, right? What, regardless of the school of thought of the particular translation, they all rely more or less on the same textual basis. Right. 
Yeah. Uh, and so when we say textual basis, um, we are talking about the other language manuscripts. Uh, mm -hmm. and so we'll, we'll talk about, you know, where they come from, uh, what they are, that kind of stuff. But uh, this is, you know, historically, you know, what has been discovered archaeologically, you know, what do we have available to work with? Where do they come from? How old are they? You know, all that fun stuff. Uh, we're going to start with the New Testament because, well, it's easier. Uh, the, the first major textual basis for the New Testament is called the Textus Receptus. Uh, this was actually created uh, in 1550 by Desiderius Erasmus. Uh, he was a sort of colleague of Martin Luther, John Calvin, the other major reformers, although he didn't really go into the Reformation nearly the way they did. He remained with the Catholic Church. Um, so this, this Textus Receptus that he created is based upon six, uh, we call them Byzantine Greek manuscripts um, from the 12th to 14th century, um, as well as the, the Latin Vulgate, where he didn't have a, a Greek basis for them. Uh, so the goal was to take what was available at the time in Greek and create a standard Greek manuscript that could then be used to translate into other languages. Um, so, so Erasmus, he was functioning as a text critic, right? He was yes. taking these these Byzantine texts, and you said you said twelfth to fourteenth centuries. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was taking them, and I'm I, I, I'm not just making a statement. I'm asking a question here, Keith. Mm -hmm. And he was like comparing and contrasting and evaluating the readings of those manuscripts and then assembling the evidence from those readings into one single manuscript that we call the Textus Receptus. Is that right. correct? Yes. So if so, since there were six of them, let's say you know five of them said one thing, but the sixth one had a variation. Mm -hmm. you know, it said something different. He would say, all right, well, these five have it one way. And these five are maybe the older ones. The newer one is the one with the variation. So I'm going to go with what these five say, and that's what I'm going to write down in mine. Mm -hmm. um, and then doing that for every single passage all the way through the entire New Testament. Right. And so the thing to understand here is that the Textus Receptus as a basis for the King James translation, right, yes. um, is itself an eclectic text, with text which means it is uh, a text that's assembled Mm -hmm. together um it, it, it doesn't just exist somewhere before erasmus creates it on the basis of these other manuscripts that are available to him right he assembles it from these pre-existing manuscripts it, so it's eclectic and and it's also and again the whole the whole enchilada is like this in bible in in, in text criticism and bible translation yes. it's all like this but erasmus is making interpretive decisions right mm -hmm. he is deciding which reading he thinks best represents the original, right? right? Um, in 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 that work of putting together the text Yes. Yeah. And so yeah, so it's it's good to to take the moment to explain that because pretty much all of the other ones we're going to look at are also variations on this idea. Yeah, variations um, on the theme. Yeah. yeah. So so when we talk about the other textual basis for the New Testament and the Old Testament the overwhelming majority of the time, it's not, all right, here is this one manuscript from a thousand years ago. It's here are these 5,000 manuscripts from a 1,000 year period of time. And some very scholarly people said, all right, let's look at all of these, let's compare them, let's contrast them. And then based upon that, compile a single document. Yes. That doesn't match any of them, but yes. that we think is as close to the original. Um, as we can as, get. Yeah. Yes. So, so Erasmus is doing that with a handful of manuscripts that were available to him in the 1500s. And the Textus Receptus, um, this was used by Martin Luther. This was used by John Calvin, um, Ulrich Zwingli, people translating in other European languages. It was used by uh, William Tyndale, uh, although he also did some of his own work independently. Um, and then this is the basis for the King James Version, and then obviously also the New King James Version. Um, of the English translations that are available to us today, though, those are the only two. 
uh, that would take into account the Textus Receptus in any real large fashion. Um, all of the others are going to use the others that we're about to talk about. Uh, there are two different but similar um, variations on this idea more contemporary to our times. One is called the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament, and the other is the Nestle Aland uh, Greek New Testament. Um, both of these um, have gone through various editions. Um, so the Westcott and Hort was originally created in 1881 um, and then has been updated periodically since then. Um, it's based on Alexandrian Greek texts, uh, which we don't have as many of them as we have of Byzantine ones, but they are older than the Byzantine ones. Um, so most of those texts come from the third century and later um, versus when we're talking about the Byzantine ones that Erasmus used, they were from the 12th to 14th century. Uh, maybe we should pause, Keith, to say, mm -hmm. to maybe explain what we mean by Byzantine and Alexandrian. Sure. Yeah. So well, basically, go ahead. Okay. So um, historically, there have been different regions where manuscript copying primarily took place. Uh, one of those would be Alexandria, Egypt, uh, which obviously is famous for the, the library that was in Alexandria that um, was destroyed by fire. Um, but you know, the city of Alexandria has, has been a center of learning and study uh, and all of that for a very, very long time. The Byzantine manuscripts uh, come from the, the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so this would be more actually in Greece and think of like the city of Constantinople, Istanbul, um, that sort of region of the world, uh, which was also another certain center uh, of learning, um, primarily because it's the mix or the, the um, place where Europe and Asia meet. Uh, so you have the, these two trading back and forth and you know speaking different languages coming from different backgrounds. So it made sense that this would be a place where uh, translation where you know scribal copying all that kind of stuff would take place so textual traditions yes describe, there are communities of scribes in each of these locations mm -hmm. and they're doing their work over the course of centuries and and textual traditions emerge from right. and kind of span out from each of these locations right uh, and and though these traditions have identifiable characteristics and a traceable history Mm -hmm. Right, so there, there's a there's a Byzantine family of New Testament manuscripts, and that that share that are traceable to that history and share those characteristics. Right. And there's an Alexandrian family of New Testament manuscripts that it has that traceable history and share those characteristics, so on and so forth. Right. And a large part of that is, you know, until the invention of the printing press, mm -hmm. all of this had to be done by hand. Oh. Uh, and so you either had, all right, here's this copy and I'll, I'm writing by hand looking back and forth right. or you had somebody reading it aloud and yeah. a whole bunch of people writing it down right um, and so if a change or a mistake or something occurred well I'm copying this copy and so that mistake is going to stay with it or that change is going to stay sure. with it yeah so that is the where you know we talked about the telephone game the last time, and that's not a great example by any stretch of what happens uh, with this. But this is the one time where it does sort of, you know, if I say this to you and you write it down, and then somebody else is using your work, um, they're going to take that and it's just going to keep being repeated over and over. Right. Because say I make a copy of say I make a copy of First John, mm -hmm. handwritten copy of First John. And then I hand it off to you, Keith, and I say, you make a handwritten copy. Here's a copy of First John. Now you make a handwritten copy of this. Mm -hmm. You're working with mine. Right. Unless you have the original, original, the copy of First John that I was working with, right? To compare my work with what I started with. And if you don't have, if you don't have that for a point of comparison, you're just using what I've given you. Right. And you're just going to copy what I've given you. Right. right. And if that includes you know, a misspelled word or a missed word or an inserted word yeah. or, you know, we, we got a couple of words out of order. Or sometimes we're like we missed a line, right? Mm -hmm. I'm copying my candlelight in the dark and man, I just missed a line. Yep. You know, those those things start to show up 
in copy after copy after copy in these in these textual traditions. Right. Right. Which is what makes you know uh, the the concept of textual criticism and the idea of all right, let's go, let's take all of these copies and look at them and try to see where these things happen so that we can get back to uh, what it was meant to be. Um, that is a very valuable thing to do, uh, rather than just saying, all right, we're going to keep copying the copy of the copy of the copy. That's all right. Well, let's go back to as close to the original as we can uh, and look at what we have to figure out how we get there. And this is one reason why the age of the manuscript matters. Yes. Right? One reason. Presumably, the older it is, the closer it is in time to the original uh, the, the, the closer it is, the closer textually it is to the original, right? right. There's that working less presumption. Right. Yeah. So what happened between, maybe we should mention, or maybe you plan to mention right. what happened between the Textus Receptus and the creation of these modern uh, editions of the Greek New Testament, Westcott Port and Nestle Aland. That, that, I mean, what, what are some of the discoveries that happened that, okay, you know what? The Textus Receptus was good for its time, but now we need something new because. Well, the, the biggest thing is the sheer number of manuscripts that um, you know, archaeology as a, a field of science has exploded in the last couple hundred years. Um, it, in particular, it took off in the 17 and 1800s. Now, this is part of the, the age of enlightenment, the age of reasoning um, that, you know, we don't want to just base everything on tradition. We want to go back to the original sources. Uh, we want to, and, and sort of every area of life, not just yeah. theology. Um, right. This is you know, architecture uh, said, all right, we're going to go back to the way the Greeks and the Romans did it. And we're going to base, you know, our buildings upon you know, their, their concepts. So we're going to you know, do some of the original methodologies of, you know, planning out cities, laying roads, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so archaeology as a field became very valuable mm -hmm. and therefore archaeological digs and discoveries became much more prominent. Uh, and sort of as a, a happy byproduct of that is a whole bunch of manuscripts were discovered along the way. They and, weren't available to Erasmus. Yeah, when, available to the translators of the King James Bible. Right. Yeah. yeah, when when Erasmus was doing his work, all of these other things were still buried on the ground somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody even knew they existed. Right. And, and some of them are, as we said, they're substantially, substantially older. Um, you know, the difference between the third century and the, the 12th century, that's 900 years. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's a big that's difference. A big deal. Right, right. <laughs> And, and so yeah, well that so that was you know in the 1800s when Westcott and Hort was being put together, you know, that was sort of the rationale is all right, you know Erasmus did an excellent job for his time, but we now have hundreds if not thousands of more manuscripts to look at. Some of those manuscripts are hundreds of years older. And we have a whole lot more to work with. So let's do the same job, but let's do it better with the material that is available now. It's available now, yeah. And this is also why all of these keep periodically being updated. Yes. As more discoveries are made, they say, all right, well, let's take that into account and see if it changes anything. I think Nestle Aland is in its 28th. Yes. Right? I think it's yeah. in its 28th. Yeah. So yeah. 28th edition. Yeah. So it keeps, it keeps getting updated. So, it, and if you want to know, Right, like okay, I'm reading the ESV or the NIV or the New American Standard or whatever, and you want to know what the textual basis is for your New Testament in that translation. Read the preface to the Bible. Right, it, it, don't just skip that. Read it. They're going to explain to you what their um, philosophy of translation is: formal equivalence or dynamic equivalence or something in between. Right. And they're also going to state what the textual basis is for their translation, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I'm, you know, I'm just making this up because I don't know off the top of my head which one the NIV uses, but it might, it, the preface of whatever, it's going to state, you know, the, the, this, we, we primarily are using the Nestle Alan 27th edition or whatever, right. right, for our New Testament, yeah. The overwhelming majority of modern translations use Nestle Alan or 
the UBS United Bible Societies, they did the same thing. Um, yeah. It's a slightly different variation on it. Yeah. Um, which it is in its fifth edition. Fifth, yeah. the, the UBS is. Uh, yeah. The Nestle Land is in the 28th. Um, although I think both of them are being re updated. I think so. Yeah. Because yeah. that was I think the, the 28th of the Nestle Land was occasioned by some especially some updates in the Catholic epistles, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's see here. It's telling me about the legacy, the philosophy. So I'm looking at the English standard version. Uh, it is, there's a whole family of um, translations that all stem from one another. So the English Standard Version is a revision of the New Revised Standard Version, which is a revision of the Revised Standard Version, which is a revision of the <laughs> English Revised Version, right. uh, which goes back to the King James Version eventually. Right. So it's explaining that, explaining its philosophy, style, term, basis, and resources. All righty. So the ESV is based on the for the, for the New Testament, it uses the 1993 edition of the uh, UBS and the 27th edition of the Nestle Milan. So they use both. They use both. They I imagine many English translations do probably. Yeah. They didn't use Westcott and Hort, and they didn't use the Textus Receptus, uh, but they did use UBS and Nestle Milan. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, if you want to know what the textual basis is, read the preface to your Bible. Yeah. Uh, so, West Cotton Court, UBS, which is short for United Bible Societies, and uh, the Nestle Aland are the three main modern uh, Greek New Testaments, which stand as the basis for our English translations or any other translations for that matter, right? right. Translations into Japanese or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you if you are reading a translation that was put together in the last hundred years, there's a 99.9% .9 possibility that they use one or all of um, these three. Right. And so, and, and so, and most of the most of the time, they're actually consulting, like you say, one, two or three of these in addition to, you know, the Latin Vulgate still plays a role, mm -hmm. right? It, it still is consulted because of its antiquity and, and traditional authority and the influence that it has exerted on translations into all the European languages, right? Mm -hmm. uh, through the centuries, it just, it, it, it just is consulted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, how about we talk about the Old Testament? All righty. So the Old Testament has more time to work with, therefore more variations to work with. Um, so one of the big ones is the Septuagint, or sometimes Septuagint, and there's people you know, pronounce it differently, uh, but this is a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was done 200 BC, somewhere around there. Yeah. It was also done in the city of Alexandria, so again, you know, part of the Alexandrian family, uh, Alexandrian history. Um, it was... The story is that um, the librarian, Ptolemy, King Ptolemy's mm -hmm. librarian for the, the library there in Alexandria wanted to get the number of volumes in the library up to 500,000. And he specifically said to the King Ptolemy, we need to add the books of the Jewish law to our library, but they need to be translated from their characters into our language, into Greek. You know? um, I mean, at least that's the story. I don't know. Gotcha. It's, it's, the, the, or the origin story of the Septuagint is shrouded in legend, so to speak. Right. So but it, the, the, the Septuagint exerted a great deal of influence on the New Testament. Yes. Um, and is very important in, as, in its own right as, as a textual source for the Old Testament. Right. Yeah. So the, the name Septua, you know, 770. Now, the again, we don't know for sure, but the tradition is that there were 70 translators uh, who worked on this to take it from being in Hebrew and Aramaic 
into Greek. Uh, and as Nate just said, uh, this was very commonly used in the New Testament era. Uh, there are a number of Old Testament passages that are quoted in the New Testament, but it's obvious that they are quoting the Septuagint version of those passages and not the original Hebrew or Aramaic. Uh, and part of that is because there were a good number of Jewish people in the New Testament era who no longer could speak Hebrew or Aramaic. They could only speak Greek. Uh, and so that was the Bible they used, just like, you know, we can't speak Greek or Hebrew today, so we use our English Bibles. Um, and so, yeah, this is, it's a very common, there are copies of it that still exist today, uh, very influential on both the way we interpret and use the Old Testament, as well as the formation of the New Testament. The next one are the Targums. Uh, these are Aramaic translations slash interpretations of the Old Testament. Uh, primarily, they come from the period of the exile and afterwards, uh, so a little bit older than the, the Septuagint, uh, at least initially, um, and they were meant to be teaching tools for the people, uh, so they include a lot of commentary and other notes. You can think of them as sort of like being a study Bible, uh, where you have the, the scripture itself, but then you have all of these other little cross-references and notes and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and again, for the people who spoke Aramaic, which is a very similar language to Hebrew uh, and was the language of like the Persian Empire and uh, those groups farther east, um, this was very common, and very popular with them. Uh, we've already talked about the Latin Vulgate, uh, but this is the translation of the Old Testament and the New Testament, too, as far as that goes, into Latin. Uh, it was completed by a guy named Jerome in AD 382. Um, and it, as Nate said earlier, it's also been very uh, heavily influential. Um, and it's especially for older translations. So when we looked at, you know, the English translations that came before the King James, a lot of them are just, you know, let's take the Latin Vulgate and translate it into English. Um, for the Catholic Church, the Latin Vulgate is still very important, very prominent. Uh, and so the Catholic uh, translations into other languages, uh, even more recent ones, will still use the Latin Vulgate um, quite extensively as part of their basis. One of the really big ones for the Old Testament, which is uh, a good chunk of why uh, Nestle Law and UBS have so many editions, uh, and so does the Hebrew version of that when we get to it, uh, is the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and so uh, the Qumran community over around the Dead Sea, um, they were uh, Essenes who lived in the time of the, like the period before the New Testament, the New Testament itself immediately afterwards. Uh, and they, they were sort of, they secluded themselves uh, quite a bit. Uh, they were a very isolated community, um, but one that was very heavily involved in writing, copying, keeping the law alive and active and so on. Um, and then when their community was eventually destroyed, uh, they took great pains to hide a lot of those copies. Uh, so back in the 1940s, I think it was just like a shepherd boy, you know, was randomly throwing rocks into a cave and he heard one of them shatter a pot. Like, well, that's weird. So he went in and started digging and found these. And then you know, as after that, you know, archaeologists have just descended upon all of the caves and areas around the Qumran community and are still finding oh, thousands of documents. Yeah. Yes. One uh, of the great finds of the last hundred years. Yes. Uh, because some of them are incredibly ancient. Uh, we, they're, they're copies that are a thousand years older than um, ones that we had previously. They go back to the pre New Testament era. Uh, yeah. So that it's been a very valuable resource in studying the Old Testament and um, both the Old Testament itself, as well as the other writings and thought processes uh, of the day. Great. Uh, then there's the Masoretic texts. Uh, the Masoretes were another Jewish community. Uh, they live primarily between the 6th and 10th centuries AD, so a little ways removed from the, the actual writing of the Old Testament. Um, but they did a number of things that have greatly aided us. One is, again, making copies of the Old Testament. Uh, and so you know, we can compare those you know, older to the newer, 
um, before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Masoretic text was a primary source for a lot of people doing Old Testament Hebrew studies. Um, it was the oldest Hebrew we had for the most part. Right. And they, they, they really, as far as we can tell, standardized the text, right? They, mm -hmm. you know, they, they made it uniform. And the Masoretes added the, aren't they the ones that added the vowel pointing system? Yeah. So the Hebrew language doesn't have vowels in it. The, the written part of it only shows the consonants, which is fine if you understand the language, not so fine if you don't. <laughs> um, so, so what the Masoretes did is, and they were very meticulous about this. They, they said, you know, we don't want to change the, mm -hmm. the manuscripts but uh, we do want to make it easier to read and understand. Um, well, they were aware that the time was coming when there wasn't going to be anybody around mm -hmm. who could read the text without its vowels. Right. So they, they invented this little series of dots and dashes that go above and below the letters um, to show what the vowels should be. You know, if it's this, it's an A. If it's this, it's an E, uh, and so on. And so... So they've, they've done a lot to, to help us be able to understand uh, the old. Well, I think the, the Masoretic text, and I think you already referred to this, but the, 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 what we have of it, it comes from around 1000-ish AD, right? Yeah. So that was prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was the oldest Hebrew text that we had available to us. I mean, there were some scraps here and there. Right. But the but the, the Masoretic text was in yeah, and this is actually so if you if you are starting to get bogged down and bored in this conversation, <laughs> I can't imagine why that would happen. <laughs> yeah, has this gone on long enough? Is the torture over yet? We're almost done. Right. right, but um, but one of the big reasons why this conversation is important is because. You know, that was a big issue prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So people who were critical of the Bible and wanted to say that, you know, it's just a bunch of made up stories or, you know, there's no possible way that what we have is right because it's just copies and copies and copies. And, you know, the Masoretic text is the oldest one we have, and it's a thousand plus years removed from the original. So there's no possible way it could be right. You know, that was a pretty common attitude um, amongst people, especially in the 1800s, the early 1900s. Uh, and I mean, still prevalent today, but one of the things that has course corrected is, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls finding copies that are a thousand years older than the Masoretic text, uh, comparing the two and saying, oh no, they're actually, they're almost identical to one another. The, the Masoretes did a remarkable job of making sure they didn't make mistakes in their copying. And so we can trust what they had to say uh, with a great deal of accuracy. Right. Um, one of the things that is interesting um, is comparing and contrasting the Masoretic text and, the, and what we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls with the Septuagint, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are differences between the, the Septuagint on the one side and the Hebrew documents on the other, right? <laughs> um, and that creates the question, okay, was, was the Hebrew text that the Septuagint translators used different from the Hebrew text as we now have it? And is that the reason for the differences? Or did the Septuagint translators simply take a lot of liberties and uh, make a lot of changes in their translate in their in their work of translation and is that the reason for the differences it could be a little bit of both right we, ultimately we can't answer that question uh, not in any definitive way any anyways but there is a little bit of an open question there at least with regard to some parts of the old testament mm -hmm. um, because of the differences between the septuagint on the one side and the hebrew texts on the other right. And, and something else that we haven't talked about yet um, is translation committees. Mm. And what will often happen, and the, the Septuagint is an example of this, is you know, it's a translation of one document into a different language, mm -hmm. but it's not that all 70 people worked on every single passage. It's right. 
all right, you're going to take this one, you're going to take this one, you're going to take this one. And just realistically, some of them were better translators right. than others. Right. Uh, and so, or, you know, some of them had a different opinion on how to translate right. than others. And so, you know, we were talking about this with the NIV. Sometimes it's more dynamic. Sometimes it's more formal. Well, part of that is because the, the people that translated part of it wanted a more dynamic approach and the people that translated a different part of it wanted a more formal approach. Um, but it's not the same group of people doing the whole entire thing. Uh, and so you get some of that personality coming out and as well as those deviations coming out. Um, and so that's part of it too with the, the Septuagint. Uh, you know, the group that did Genesis is a different group than the ones that did Job. Uh, and right. so they, they approached it differently. They translated it with a, a different goal in mind or a different method in mind. Yeah. So for our, for our English Old Testaments, once again, you can look at the preface to your Bible to see what the textual basis is for the Old Testament and the English translation that you use. Mm -hmm. Almost all modern English translations start with the Masoretic text because it's the complete Hebrew text that we have. And then they, they, they consult the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, uh, the Targums, uh, you know, the Vulgate, and and sometimes um, they will choose a reading uh, from one of those other sources rather than from the Masoretic text because when all things, when all the evidence is considered, it appears that the reading from one of those other sources is superior to what the Masoretic text offers, right? Um, a good example of this is uh, 1 Samuel 13, 1. Just, and I'm just going to refer to it. Go check out 1 Samuel 13, 1 uh, and say, com compare, and co compare and contrast the English Standard Version and the NIV on 1 Samuel 13, 1. And then look at the footnotes that they give you. They'll give a little, a little number or letter next to the sentence or next to the verse. And that directs you to the corresponding number or letter in the footnotes down at the bottom of the page. And I'm going to give a little bit of explanation of where this reading comes from, the Masoretic text or the Septuagint or the Dead Sea Scrolls and why they chose it. Sometimes the rationale is there, sometimes it isn't. Um, but that's a good example of, mm -hmm. of, of, of sometimes, even though the Hebrew Masoretic text is the normal basis, um, sometimes they will choose, they consult all, the, all of these other sources and sometimes choose a reading based on those other sources. Right. And then the last one is the BHS, the Biblia Hebraica Stuart Gaitensia, which is the Hebrew version of the Nestle Land or UBS or West Cotton Port, um, they, where they try to take everything that's available and create one text that's not identical to any of them but is saying, all right, let's get as close to the original as we can. And as Nate said, a large part of that is the Masoretic text copied over just with some changes made based upon all of the other discoveries. Sure. Uh, and it's in its fourth edition with the fifth edition in progress. I think it's been in progress for quite some time. Yeah, it's been in progress for like 10 to 15 huge, years. Huge, huge job. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah. That one, as well as the others, you know, most, most modern English translations are going to say, we want to use everything that is available to us, and we don't want to limit ourselves. Yes. Uh, and so the overwhelming majority of them are going to say, all right, we use this and this and this and this and this, and then made our best judgment accordingly. Yes. So for people like Keith and I, this is all very interesting and exciting, and we love it. We do apologize if it's bored you to tears and you've already turned two us out. Right. Um, but we, we, do, we wouldn't be talking about these things if we didn't think there was value in knowing them mm -hmm. and understanding the realities behind the English Bibles that we use and value so highly, mm -hmm. right? I think we think it benefits the people of God to know this story, to know these facts and these factors, right? There's a lot to think about. Right. And um, as we said last time, this can help us to value uh, some particular people in the body of Christ, um, Bible, Bible translators and text critics, mm -hmm. uh, and the role that they play in making the Bible available to us. Um, you know, if you can help us to value them so much more highly, knowing a little bit about all that goes into their work and the work that they, that they do. Right. 
Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things that I've come across both in preaching, teaching, as well as when I worked in a Bible bookstore is that there is a tendency to almost degrade translators and translations. Oh, that one is just terrible. Oh, that one's not worth your time, that kind of thing. Um, and yes, there may be a couple of those that warrant that. But again, overwhelmingly, you know, an enormous amount of time and dedication had to go into creating any of the translations that you're going to look at. And they were all created with a specific goal in mind. Uh, and so just because you know, one translation doesn't meet your goal, that doesn't mean that it's a bad translation. Uh, it just means that you have a, a difference in what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so further, then if we can find translations that will match our goals, or if we um, make our goals match the translations, either way, um, we'll be much better suited to accomplishing what we're trying to do. Uh, and so, especially next time when we actually go into some of these translations in detail and talk about them, you know, the, our goal uh, as pastors and as presenters here is not to say, this one's good, this one's bad, you should use this one, you should throw this one away. Uh, our goal is to say, here's the information, now use that information to see which one will be best for you. And it may be very different than the one that's best for me or that's the one the best for a particular setting. Yeah, for absolute sure. Yeah. And, you know, when we, when in our next episode, as we wrap up here, in our next episode, when we do compare and contrast the, the major English translations, we'll give our opinions on um, why we primarily use the ones that we use, um, and what we think some of the strengths and weaknesses are of the respective translations. But again, it's not a matter so much of good or bad or right or wrong as it is just understanding the purpose of each translation and kind of where it comes from, what its niche is, and, and, and understanding how to um, use them together. As Keith said, don't just use one, but use several. Understanding how to use them together can be very beneficial and productive. Yep. So that is where we are heading to next time. Uh, if you've made it to this far to the end of the video, we congratulate you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you for sticking around with us. Yes, for very for for sure. Right. Uh, until next time. Yep. Thank you.